Thanks for joining us online today. We hope you're blessed by this message. If you have a prayer need today, please visit our website, SiouxFallsFirst.com. Are you listening? We're all going to end up in the same place anyway. It's not stealing if it's offered free online. I just have way too much going on. I would do anything for an Apple Watch. But it was one little white lie. Who decided it was swearing anyway? I wish they'd just go die. Whatever path you believe in is fine with me. Nobody was around. I was just kidding. It doesn't really count. We didn't go all the way. You're just old school. I just don't have time to read the Bible. They always have the nicest stuff. Nah, I just rip it off Pirate Bay. You can rest when you're dead. It's just entertainment. I'm not hurting anyone. You should come hear my pastor. Must be nice to have that kind of money. But my parents don't honor me. Can't make it to church in the summer because we have softball games every weekend. There's just too much going on. OMG. I deserve it. It's not going to hurt anything. It was just given to them. It's not really cheap. I hate them. Well, I'm excited on this VBS Family Sunday to begin a brand new series that actually our epic kids will be doing along with us for the next 10 weeks or so called Top 10. It's a series on the Ten Commandments. And as we really look at what God gave us over 3,500 years ago through a man by the name of Moses, for you and I even today, there's some powerful things that we can take away from the Ten Commandments. So today we're going to lay the foundation and actually talk about the first commandment. If you have your Bibles or devices, you can turn to Deuteronomy 4, Matthew 22, and Exodus 20. If you can't, you can read it on the screen as well. But I want to start by addressing some questions that have been asked for ages when it comes to the Ten Commandments. Are the Ten Commandments relevant for today? That this law that was given over 3,500 years ago, several millennia, to the children of Israel, do they really have application for us? Or did Jesus come to update or even replace them? And I think these are good questions. But we as the people of God need to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's inside of us. We need to be ready to respond to the questions that the world's asking. Because sometimes the church is answering the questions the world's not asking. And I believe it's important that the questions that are being asked, the questions about faith, the questions about God and purpose and eternity, we need to be ready to give answer to. So what makes them relevant today? Well, first of all, I want to say that there are really three divisions of this word we call law. And what makes the Ten Commandments relevant today is that they are considered to be moral law. Different than the other laws given to Moses on Mount Sinai. You see, the other laws and regulations, for the most part, are not relevant today. Because, for example, Jesus came as the substitute and died on the cross for our sins. That's why you didn't bring animals in today to sacrifice. We also understand that because the other laws categorized as either ceremonial or civil were primarily relevant to a particular form of government or cultural context specific to Israel superseded by Christ. So these laws were superseded by him. The Ten Commandments also have lasting moral authority and they provide an objective standard of right and wrong for not only the society then but the society now. In fact, there is universal, it's universally binding for every society and every culture for all time. Now, while it is true that we are not saved by the Ten Commandments, here's what we need to understand. We are kept safe by them. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40, which is really a theme verse for this series. Because when we hear commandments, many times our, word go, our mind goes negative. But when you really consider what God has outlined 
on these tablets of stone that he gave to Moses, we see that what is written is life-giving. And it says in Deuteronomy 4 verse 40, keep his decrees and commands which I'm giving you today so that it may go well with you and not only you but your children after you that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. So when we consider the Ten Commandments, we see that they are for our benefit. But they not only benefit us, but they benefit our children and our children's children for all generations to come. They're timeless principles that produce life and blessing. And I will tell you that they are not just commands. But if you see, they give us a direction arrow to the blessings that are fulfilled through Jesus Christ. So the alternative is what? It's chaos. It's lawlessness. In history reveals to us that whenever a society becomes morally corrupt, civility is destroyed. That society becomes unstable and even nations and civilizations collapse. One example of many is the Roman Empire. When they gave no longer regard to the laws and the moral fabric that God had outlined, they destroyed themselves. And I, so I believe this series is very important for us right now. In the life of our nation, where we stand as a culture, and where we stand as a society, that we embrace the things that God has for us so that we can experience the benefit of his blessing. You see, God desires to bring good into our lives, and that's what the Ten Commandments are. So the other question is, didn't Jesus come to replace or to at least update them? Well, it's interesting because in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. He came to bring deeper spiritual meaning to these things that were written from the heart of God many years ago. In fact, he came not only to, he came not to write the law on what? Tablets of stone, but he came to write them on human hearts. You see, he came to bring them to a greater level of even relationship in our lives, understanding that what God gives us as a father is for our good. And it's because of his relationship for us. In fact, when a Pharisee came and asked Jesus the greatest commandment in the law, he replied in Matthew 22, verse 37 through 40, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because all the law and the prophets hang on these commandments. You see, what Jesus was doing with the Pharisees and actually giving us the understanding of how we, we navigate these Ten Commandments into the New Covenant, is that he said, these two commandments sum up the Ten Commandments. It's interesting because these two commandments deal with our vertical relationship with God and our horizontal relationships with people. Now, how many know if one of those things gets out of balance, it affects the other? If you don't have a right relationship with God, then your relationship with people are affected. If you don't have a right relationship with people, your relationship with God is affected. And he's saying that these commandments are summed up in loving the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and loving your neighbor as yourself. You see, the first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship with God. He teaches us how we are to love him. How we are to honor him. How we are to give him preeminence in our life. How we are to give him supreme authority in the decisions of our lives. How he is to be our foundation. And then the 
final six commandments deal with our relationship with other people and how to honor people and how to respect people and how to love people. So really, Jesus is again emphasizing the importance of the Ten Commandments. So I want to start off this morning by talking to you a few moments about the First Commandment. So in Exodus chapter 20, we'll be reading a lot from this, obviously, over the next few weeks because that's where they're contained. But it says in verses 1 through 3, And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So let's go back. Who spoke all of these words? God did. The creator of the universe, the sustainer of all life, is the one that spoke these things through Moses. And so we must give these words primary attention. They are not ten suggestions. They are not ten ideas that may work out for you. They're not ten steps for highly successful people. They are things that God desires for us to regard. And the very first commandment is one that helps us answer the question, who's number one? Who is number one? Because you know what? If you don't get the first commandment and, and you're not able to answer that question, you're going to have a hard time navigating the other nine. You're going to have a hard time understanding them. Who, who's number one? You see, God wants us to have an exclusive relationship with him. A relationship that is unique, a relationship that is personal, a relationship where you communicate to one another that's based on, on love. And, and God has demonstrated his love to us time and time again. And, and, and he wants to be the, 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 the very God that we serve. In fact, he says, you are to have no other gods before me. Why is it significant for us to answer this question? It's simply this, the smorgasbord of gods. The polytheism that dominates our culture. You see, the first and foundational commandment tells us that we must love, worship, and serve him only. That he's the one that we need to pursue. He's the one that we need to honor as God in our lives. And it's interesting because when this was written, all of Israel's neighbors, everyone around them, were serving other gods. We're worshiping and following after other gods. And we can read through the record that so many times the nation of Israel was tempted to follow them. It's kind of tempting sometimes to follow what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is saying. Conversations that are happening at school or at work just kind of enter in and, and kind of minimize what God has really spoken. So it's not only very significant to them, but it has very significant meaning to us today. In fact, a man by the name of Mark Rucker, who wrote the book Ten Commandments, Ethics for the 21st Century, says that prohibition against the worship of all but one deity was unique in religious history. He continues, the other nations of the world were polytheistic and thus innately tolerant of the views of others as it was believed that no one God had absolute power and controlled all the phenomena of, cult, of nature. This same tolerance that characterized pagan cultures in the biblical period is now true of much of the Western culture. And isn't it sad that when conversations happen that speak the truth in love. Now, let me back up. I know there's a lot of people that are mean-spirited that are speaking the truth absent of love. And can I just encourage you, if you are doing that, keep your mouth closed because you make hard on people that write, speak the truth in love, right? Mean-spirited and argue and debate and get mad and turn red, all those things. We don't need that. God doesn't need you to do that. But even when we speak the truth in love and the heart is pure and the motive is right, how many know many times when we speak about serving one God and one God only, you're accused of being a bigot. You're accused of being narrow-minded or, or being arrogant. Tolerance 
has become the buzzword. And what's difficult about that is because it seems like so many people are speaking so many different things in culture and society that the enemy uses this word tolerance and he uses this word of, of, of you're being offensive by what you're saying to muzzle our mouth to keep us from speaking the truth even in love. And the problem with that is that because the voice of the people of God and the voice of the church has been silenced, that are really called to deliver the gospel, which means good news. The primary voice becomes the one that we're hearing. It becomes the voice that will educate and inform our society, our culture, our co-workers, our fellow students, but it's based on falsehood. There's no truth to it. And, and so I believe that as we consider the, the laws of God, we consider the commandments of God, we got to say, Lord God, you've called us to be a voice. You've not called us to be quiet because, God, we're, we're, we're bringing something to culture. We're bringing something to society that is life-giving. That God tells us that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the light on the, the hill, city on a hill that cannot be hidden. That we are to be people that are, that are expressive in relationship. We're building relationships, but we are having conversations. The world is having a conversation, and God wants you and I to open the door for conversation and speak truth with a motivation of love towards other people. As we spoke about even... I believe a few weeks ago, when you consider eternity, the eternal implications, we can't help but speak up. So when we consider the smorgasbords of gods that are being portrayed to us today in culture, and it's like almost every day, there's another one, another one rising up. God reminded me of this, and it's not on the screen because God gave me this last night late, but Colossians chapter 2. You see, the Colossians were being approached with these ideas and falsehoods, false teachers, that was kind of getting their attention a little bit. And so the apostles, the apostle Paul spoke these words in Colossians 2, verse 8, and I believe they're, they're, they speak to us today. It says, see to it that no one, no one, not outside the church, not inside, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, empty, and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. These ideas that spring forth, these, these, these crutches for human philosophies and arguments that are giving that they're being given in, in society today. He says, see that no one binds you. See that no one traps you or arrests you, takes you um, and imprisons you with these thoughts, these ideas. Because he says, this kind of world view is death. Anything outside of a Christ-centric world view is eternally fatal. So even though there's, there's, there's many gods, he's a smorgasbord and everybody's saying it's okay, it doesn't matter which one you take on as long as you're sincere. You can follow any road you want as long as you're sincere. We can't buy into this lie from the enemy. Let me illustrate it this way. It's like you come to my house and you have this horrible headache. And you stumble up onto the porch and you ring the doorbell. And you say, do you have some ibuprofen that I can use? I have a real bad headache and pray for me. I've been, you know, AIDS for divine healing. I'll take ibuprofen. Um, and I say, well, let me go check. And I go to my medicine cabinet and I'm looking through all the bottles and looking to see which is there. And man, I don't find ibuprofen. But I find a bottle, I don't know why it's in there, but there's a bottle of arsenic. And I, and I open it up, and it kind of looks like ibuprofen. How many snow some pills look 
Similar? And so I come to you and I say, you know what, I'm so sorry I don't have ibuprofen, but I found something that looks like it. And if you just believe it'll be okay, if you just say it'll be okay, you take this, which looks like ibuprofen, but it's arsenic, and everything will just be fine. You don't have to worry about it. After all, the important thing is your faith, right? It's nonsense. What's important is not your faith or your belief, but it's the object of your faith and the object of your belief. You see, the arsenic is going to affect you regardless of what you believe. Regardless of what you say. Regardless of your sincerity. Your choice on the God you will serve will bring life or death. And that's why this commandment is so important as we close and the worship team comes out. I want to go back to Acts chapter 17. And and you don't have to turn there. You can read it later. But you remember when this man by the name of Paul, who used to be Saul, he was transformed by the love of God that arrested him when he was on a journey to do something that was not right. And God literally prevented him from destruction, from self-destructing. He saved him. He used to be Saul. He became Paul. Well, Paul walks into the city of Athens one day. And the Bible says that He becomes distressed. Now, you know, any word with stress in it is not good. Some of you have been there. And he walks in and he sees all of these gods in this pluralistic culture. Everybody's worshiping their own God. Everybody's doing their own thing. They're giving no regard to the moral law, to the standards that God had set, that he had given them. And as Paul walks through the city, he's a passion. He's righteously angry. You know why? Because he used to be the fool. He used to be the one that blindly placed his faith in a God other than Jehovah, and it only brought death. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, what if God just dropped Paul right into Sioux Falls? What would he carry? What would he say? What would he speak to leaders about, spiritual leaders? What if he had an opportunity to have one son to hear? What would he say? Maybe I wouldn't want him to speak. You know what I mean? And yet he came into this culture, this society that was polytheistic, that that was pluralistic, that was serving their own gods, doing their own thing, and thinking everything was okay, and everybody was saying it's okay. You, you, can, you, can, serve, you can serve anybody you want, as long as you're sincere. It's okay. And listen to what he said towards the end of 17, verse 29. It says, therefore, since we are God's offspring, you did not get here by yourself. You didn't even get here by your mom and dad. You you came here because God fashioned you and formed you in your mother's womb with a purpose and a plan, and he's really the one that brought you into this world. So he's saying, hey, we are God's offspring, all of us. It doesn't matter what nation, what culture, what background, we are all God's offspring. And he goes on to say, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by designer skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now, he commands all people everywhere to repent, to change their mind. Here's the reality. With knowledge, with truth, comes responsibility. And every single one of us this morning know what's right, who God's called us to serve, that there is to be no other gods before him. 
And you know what? You may sit there and think, I can't do this. And you know what? You can't do this without Christ. That's why you can't take Christ out of the Ten Commandments. Everything is Christ-centric. He's the one that empowers us. It's his righteousness alone. It's not ours. And yet, he helps us fulfill that standard of one God, one true God in serving him. Would you bow your heads with me? 